Hi everyone, welcome to part two of the critical period to federalism. Our questions to think about here, how did the framers of the Constitution structure the new national government to ensure that it was not too powerful? When we take a look at the government that is created by the Constitution, there was an effort to make it more powerful because it needed to be able to regulate interstate trade. It needed to be able to set tariffs. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we don't end up with a tyrannical government like many believe they had with the British Empire. So the solution comes through the separation of powers. When we had the Confederation government under the Articles of Confederation, this is Confederate, meaning that there is a weak national government holding together these powerful state governments. With the Constitution, we switch to federalism. This is a division of powers between the states and the national government. And when you take a look at the diagram here, there are certain powers that only the national government has. And there are certain powers that only the state governments have. And then there is an element of shared powers. But the other thing to keep in mind with a federal system is that the power shifts to the national government. And rather than having all of these co-equal states essentially dictate to the national government, we ha now have a national government that is much more powerful with the states subordinate to that national government. But in order to make sure that national government doesn't become too powerful, we're going to divide it into three branches. And each of those co-equal branches of government would have certain powers, and they would only be in control of those things. And so by isolating the powers of the national government into each of these three branches, we are preventing uh, one person or a handful of people from becoming too powerful because we also have a system of checks and balances. And the easiest way to think about this is the, the way that a bill becomes a law in our system. It passes both houses of Congress. It goes to the president to be signed, but the, the president can veto a bill. And at the same time, with a two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress, Congress can override a president's veto. So these are examples of the way in which the government's powers are divided and balanced by other elements within the national government. So taking a look at the structure of the new national government, I want you to be versed in the structure of the Constitution as it relates to the structure of our government. There are seven articles within the Constitution, and the first three outline the three branches of government. So Article 1 deals with the legislative branch, and their job is to make the laws. The legislative branch is made up of Congress, and we'll talk about the House of Representatives and the Senate in just a moment. Article 2 is the executive branch, and what makes this really important is that under the Articles of Confederation, we did not have an executive. There was no president of the United States. The job of the executive branch is to enforce or execute the laws or to carry them out, and I'll explain this more in just a moment. But the executive branch is made up of the president, the vice president, and the cabinet. Article 3 outlines the judicial branch, and I put a question mark here because the Constitution is a little vague about what exactly the judicial branch does beyond criminal and civil court cases. So the judicial branch is made up of the Supreme Court and all of the other federal courts that Congress creates. If you've already taken a federal government course, this will feel very repetitious. But when 
James Madison proposed the Virginia plan, what he wanted was to make sure the people's voices were heard in the government. And under the Confederation Congress, we had a unicameral legislature. We had one house of the legislature and each state had one vote. But Madison, again, wanted to make sure that the people's voice were heard. So he follows the British tradition of Parliament having the House of Lords and the House of Commons, that we would have a bicameral legislature, two houses. And Madison wanted both houses of Congress to have a number of representatives based on a state's population. But the problem, of course, is that the smaller states were concerned that their voices would be drowned out by the more populous states. And so what, what ends up happening here is we have a compromise. And it goes back to our question about for whom are we forming the government, the states or for the people? So with our bicameral legislature, it actually ends up being both. The states are represented in the Senate and the people are represented in the House of Representatives. So the upper house is the Senate and our US senators serve six year terms. As the constitution was originally written, the senators were chosen by the state legislatures. So again, the states are sort of being represented here. We've since changed this, but we'll talk about that in 1302. Two senators per state, regardless of population. To put this in perspective, Texas has over 28 million people. They have two senators. North Dakota has 700,000 people. They have two senators. By the way, there are more people living in the city of Fort Worth than in the entire state of North Dakota. But this is an example of where the states are represented. Over in the House of Representatives, this is where the voice of the people are heard. So these representatives serve two-year terms. So it always feels like these people are running for re-election. And that's kind of on purpose because we want to make sure that they are listening to our voice. And if we're not, if they're not, then we can choose someone else someone else. So this is based on population. Texas's 28 plus million people have 36 members of the House of Representatives. So who is your representative depends on where you live in the state of Texas. North Dakota's 700,000 people only have one member of the House of Representatives. So all of the people in the state vote for that same person. We had an interesting problem when it came came to the southern states and their slave populations because going along with this issue was the issue of how much tax money does each state owe to the national government. And when it came to this, they wanted to use a state's population to determine how much it owed. For the southern states, they said, well, for taxation, you can't include our slave population because they're not citizens. But when it came to the issue of representation in Congress, they said you absolutely must count our slaves as part of our state's population. And the nor northern states basic basically said, look, you can't have it both ways. So the three-fifths compromise was created to settle this issue, that we would count Three fifths of a slate of a state's total slave population for both taxation and representation purposes. Moving on to the executive branch, their purpose here is to execute the laws. We would have a president and vice president of the United States, but just to keep things interesting, we are going to elect them in the most bizarre manner possible. The electoral college system was designed to be a buffer between the voice of the people and the office of the presidency. So when we vote in a presidential election, what we're really doing is we are choosing a particular set of electors to go to the electoral college and to cast a vote for the president. 
We have a system of winner take all in 48 of the 50 states, which means it doesn't matter if you win the popular vote by an inch or a mile, you get all of that state's electoral college votes. And the number of electoral college votes is the number of senators plus the number of representatives in the House. So Texas has 38 electoral college votes. North Dakota has three. So it doesn't matter by how much you win that set of electors would go. So each political party chooses a set of electors. So you have Republican electors, you have Democratic Party electors. So if the Democratic candidate wins the election, then the Democratic set of electors for that state would go to the Electoral College. And once the electors get to the Electoral College, they are not required to vote for the candidate their state selected. So they have some freedom, some autonomy to do what they think is best. And we've been frustrated by this design because it feels like the voice of the people is not being represented. Because in five different instances, the person who won the popular vote did not become the president of the United States. And this happened most recently in the 2016 election. Donald Trump lost the popular vote by 3 million. But because of the electoral college system, he won more electoral college votes than did Hillary Clinton. So he became the president of the United States. So, this is all very frustrating. It seems like our vote doesn't count, but the way the Constitution was written, they they believed they needed some kind of buffer. Uh, as John Adams put it, there was the, the fear of the tyranny of the mob, that the people could be misguided into choosing somebody who would be inappropriate to be the president of the United States. Now, what's interesting about this is that the the decisions of the individual electors has never changed the outcome of an election. So essentially, the Electoral College has never done what it potentially was designed to do. Okay, so all of that. And then the cabinet. The, the president, the vice president, and the cabinet make up the executive branch. And when we talk about what is the purpose of the executive branch, it's to carry out the laws or to enforce the laws or execute the laws. And so the cabinet positions are the ones that contain the agencies that do this. And because I grew up in oil country in North Dakota, I'm going to use an oil field example for this. So we have, a, we have laws passed by Congress that require oil companies to reclaim the land once the drilling and production is finished. So in other words, it is a law, a federal law, that oil companies have to try to put the land back to as close to its original state as possible. And it's the job of the executive branch to make sure the oil companies are doing just that. But the president of the United States doesn't have time to drive around in a pickup truck and make sure that every well site has been reclaimed. But under the Department of the Interior, we have the Bureau of Land Management. We also have the Environmental Protection Agency. So these agencies hire people to drive around in pickup trucks and to make sure that the oil companies are obeying the laws. That is an example of how the executive branch enforces the laws. Finally, we have the judicial branch. Article three of the constitution is the shortest of the first three. And it basically says, we're gonna have a Supreme Court, we're gonna have federal courts that Congress deems necessary, 
and they'll be a chief justice of the Supreme Court. We're going to get into later kind of what is the job of the Supreme Court in terms of balancing the power within the national government. So coming back to our question to think about, how did the framers of the Constitution structure the new national government to ensure that it was not too powerful? And the answer is the separation of powers. First of all, we have the separation of powers as defined by federalism. There are powers that belong to the national government and powers that belong to the states. When it comes to the national government, we have this division be between three branches of government that, eat, that separates their powers. Each branch has separate duties and responsibilities, and they have the power to check and balance among the branches so that no one branch of government becomes too powerful. So stay tuned for part three of the critical period to federalism.